and I now have the honor to introduce you the very first speaker of today, Marcus Lundstedt, and he is Director, Media Officer and Advocacy at We Effect and We Agroforestry in Sweden. And Marcus is going to take us on a virtual trip and tell us a little bit more about how his organization has been adapting in its communication strategy and advocacy work to a digital world. Over to you, Marcus. Thank you very much, Gerald, and good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are in the world, good evening maybe. Very, very nice to be here. I'm uh, Marcus Lundstedt, like Gerald said, and I'm, I'm very happy to be invited to hopefully give you uh, uh, some pointers and inspiration from the work that we are doing at We Effect and VI Agroforestry in Sweden, but in international context. I'm going to share a, a presentation and, and base uh, this, uh, this, um, this slot here on that, and then we can have a chat, a Q&A after that. So please don't hesitate to ask questions to make this as interactive uh, as possible. And please let me know if I'm speaking too fast. I know sometimes it gets carried away and too excited when, when I speak. So, so give me a shout and say, hey, you're, you're going way too fast. So that's, that's it. I have a background as a radio journalist, and that's maybe why I speak fast sometimes. I put this uh, not very humble headline for my session here, why virtual visit is a game changer for the world. But I truly think it is. And I'll come back to that uh, on a few different occasions in the next 15 minutes. But basically what you're seeing here to get yourself acquainted to what a virtual visit is, is the CEO of the Farmers Union of Sweden. That's to the left, Anna Karin Hatt. And to the right, you have a vegetable farmer named Anesu Trizumba in Zimbabwe. And they got on a virtual visit where Anna Karin visited Anousa's farm a little over a year and a half ago, the, right in the middle of the corona pandemic. Anna Karin was supposed to go there physically, but obviously the restrictions said, no, you can't. So Anesu, she opened her, her home to cameras instead. And we logged in uh, Anna Karin Hot from Stockholm. She was able to go live and direct and see her vegetable gardens and her cows and have a conversation on the effects of the corona pandemic on farmers in Zimbabwe. And this was the first premier trip that we did. And I'll get back to that a little bit later. Uh, so uh, just a, a very a quick note on who I am. I started out not as a development aid worker. I used, I used to be a, a journalist, but then I also worked as a PR consultant. So I worked for global brands such as MTV Networks for uh, quite some time. But then 10 years ago, I decided that I want to do something with a different cause and joined We Effect and Agroforestry. And those are cooperative developmental organizations. So they were founded by the cooperative movements in Sweden. So that's the food co-op, it's the housing co-op, banking co-op, insurance co-op, and so forth. They all joined together and formed our two organizations. And today we're reaching close to 4 million people in 21 countries, and we're getting support from more or less half of Sweden through their different clients and customers that make out the Swedish cooperative movement. So I'm very excited and proud to be part of, of the We Effect and the Agroforestry movement. And I have had the opportunity to also work internationally for us. So I was based in, in Ho Chi Minh City for two years, and that's the picture to your right, where I was commuting with 10 million other bicyclists or motorcyclists through the Ho Chi Minh city to get to work. And in that capacity, I also worked from Palestine, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, and to the Philippines. I was a regional comms and advocacy lead there. Uh, so taking us back to the subject of adapting communication strategies, I thought, I think we are all quite uh, familiar with what happened in March 2020. That's at least when the corona pandemic hit Sweden and we were getting these headlines that we, it was a total mayhem, a total chaos and nothing as we thought it was before was, was in fact the same. And basically what my organizations decided to do quite rapidly was to understand that this is going to be a game changer. 
we are need to adapt to this crisis. We cannot continue as before. And we talked about it in the management group that I'm a part of that this is a crisis. Let's make the best use of it in order to streamline our processes and be as relevant as possible for the farmers and housing cooperative people that we support. Ultimately, that's what we're trying to do, supporting smallholder farmers, supporting um, cooperative housing uh, uh, people. So, and I know this is um, this uh, never waste a good crisis. It's a saying that's coming from, I believe the humanitarian organizations like the Red Cross, but it's as relevant for a long-term development organization or any organization, I think. So that was a key learning for us, we realized that we needed to adapt. And basically what we did little over just a month in from the pandemic is to develop a brand new program strategy and an advocacy strategy. And it was the first time that we did a global advocacy strategy where we set very clear messaging that was related to the corona pandemic. So we were very clear on the fact that this now pandemic will worsen hunger in the world it will, it will, and it will have impacts on people's human rights. That made us very relevant for decision makers, for journalists, because we could adapt what we are doing to the new context. And the programs were also tailored for that. So we're trying to get, for example, agricultural uh, commodities through to customers, despite the fact that we had a, a pandemic. Um, and something that was also very key in this, that we had a very clear line of communications within the organization. We had this set up with regional communications leads and advocacy leads in the five different regions that we work in. And they were instrumental in feeding the head office with information on what was going on in our program countries, but also to, to relate information to their different stakeholders in their countries. So that setup was something that we had never used before in such a, I said, strict manner, but it, and it worked really well. And something that we also made uh, use of was the fact that we had our owners, the cooperative companies that I mentioned before, as allies in this. So they were able to go out to their customers, to their clients, to their staff and say, hey, let's support the We Effect and Agroforestry in these very difficult times because we know that people in poverty are affected the worst by the corona pandemic. And we formed this uh, internal tagline, stronger together, that we used over and over again, that we need to work together in order to overcome this pandemic. And throughout this spring, another learning was that if we can't travel physically, which is usually the best tool that we have, in order to influence decision makers or uh, major donors or journalists that our work is needed and, 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 and we want to raise awareness about something, it's a physical travel. And we had several of those planned in that spring of 2020, for example, with the development aid minister. But we then thought, why not just do it digitally? That's something that we just, yeah, it popped out of the blue. Uh, and the question was, was raised, like, can we do a digital visit? And people said, yeah, yeah, sure. What is it? And we said, well, I don't know. Let's find out. And basically that's what we did. And that brings us back to that trip we did with the farmers unions, the CEO and the vegetable farmer, Anesu. They were the first one that we actually took on this virtual trip. And it was only two people, it was very downscaled. Um, and it was uh, less of a, of a, of a huge uh, setup and more of like a one camera uh, uh, visiting uh, uh, Anesu's farm, basically. So we had a, a communications team in Zimbabwe that traveled to her farm and then we set up uh, an internet hub and that was transferred then back to Stockholm where Anna Coinhub was. That's it. It was very, very basic, but it was successful. And we decided let's scale this up. So basically we, we continue to do this. We were learning as we went along. And that's something that I would like also to say that when it comes to successful communication strategies, be very agile and work quickly to learn from your mistakes. I think is something that you should always bear in mind. At least that's what we're trying to do. If we don't make mistakes, we don't learn. If we don't make mistakes, we will not transfer into different areas where we haven't been before. 
And for that sense, I think it's important just to do things. If you have an idea, do it. Maybe it was a poor idea, it didn't come through, but then we learned something from it. Um, and the second virtual visit that we did was with our board of directors. So these are the owners, the CEOs of our, of our owners in Sweden. And they're very important for us, both financially, but also politically to give us support. Um, basically what we did here was more of a grand uh, virtual visit where they received food from Mozambique in advance. So they were eating feijoada during their visit, still in Stockholm. They met the board um, and then they traveled to Mozambique to meet with farmer uh, organizations to learn about the impacts of, of the corona pandemic. There were also music played and we were trying to really stimulate all senses, despite the fact that they were very far apart. And this was, in fact, a really, really successful trip with one exception, that the Internet went down in Sweden. So for about half an hour, we had no trip at all. And I think that was, in a way, ironic. That's on the Swedish side, where usually it's more developed and you are up to speed on internet access, everything just went down. And basically when we had to relocate to a, another office and, and, and we got ourselves back. But uh, I think that was also interesting. And, 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 and a, a learning from that is, please put all your learnings into writing. Because when you develop quickly, as we did in these months, there are so many things that can get lost. Uh, you have it in your so-called muscle memories. Like, oh, we do it like this and we have a backup plan and we record this, but put it in writing. So basically we, we developed this routine arranging virtual field visits, uh, which was just like a three pager with uh, these bullet points of this is how you should do it, develop a trip, uh, think about this, um, always plan for the unplanned and so forth. And then we share that with, with communication officers, with communication agencies that supported us, and obviously with us at the head office that were ultimately in charge of, of these visits. Um, and I should also then underline that we not only did the actual trip, we also uh, made use of these trip as an, what's, what should I say, innovative way of, of, of doing development work. So we reached out to, to media and uh, we got them to write about uh, these, these visits. Uh, that this was the first time there was a virtual visit from Sweden to Mozambique, and then they interviewed some of the delegates. But then we also had the delegates now in the board of directors who write op-eds, that's what you see on the left in Swedish, uh, based on what they saw in their virtual visit, then would they relay that back to decision makers in Sweden through, through an op-ed. And that also worked really well. Um, this was the third uh, visit that we did. Uh, we brought the entire foreign committee of the Swedish parliament to Kenya. And that was for both We Effect and VA Agroforestry. And uh, basically it was yet again, another farmers cooperative and these, this group, which are instrumental for how development aid is geared toward different areas in, 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 in development aid. We obviously think that it should be geared towards smallholder farmers more than it is today, but also the volume of the, the development aid at all. So here we had several politicians that represent right-wing parties that want to lower development aid. And for us, it was important then to showcase in these visits that, hey, the needs are greater, far greater, than the support that we we're giving from Sweden. So don't, whatever you do, don't lower it. And that was the main message that we've been keep repeating actually ever since. Uh, and this is what it could look like uh, when you turn the camera the other way around. So there is quite a bit of effort to be put in if you want to be, do a successful, grand, large scale digital visit. I think all in all, we were about 10 people working on this trip. Uh, including several communications officers in, from Nairobi and our own regional communications staff and us in Stockholm. Uh, but we felt that that was needed in order for us to make this a professional trip. And we also compared this to what if we had thought and uh, brought these people, these parliamentarians from Sweden to Kenya physically, what would that have cost? Not only in money and, you know, in plane tickets and hotels, but in resources for our staff. And we realized that doing a virtual visit 
is, I would say, maybe at one tenth of the costs as compared to bringing these parliamentarians for a week's travel down to, to, to Kenya. So yes, it's a lot of work, but it's quite cost efficient, I would say. Um, and then um, again, we're just carrying on here. We had another visit to Guatemala then with our development aid minister. And uh, this was done together with other civil society organizations in Sweden. So all in all, we were six organizations that joined forces to bring the development aid uh, minister to Guatemala. That was uh, maybe not the smartest thing you could do because obviously all these organizations want to showcase that their organizations work. And it was quite confusing for the minister. What was the main message? What did we really want him to do uh, when it came down to it? But in the end, it was also uh, a good learning. We will never do that again, uh, but uh, it's still exciting way to, to, to try to work together across organizational lines, but I think we should have been fewer and with a clear joint agenda rather than six agendas. Uh, this one was uh, uh, the biggest virtual visit so far. And basically what we did was not for decision makers, it was for the customers and clients and staff from our member organizations. And they traveled to Kenya yet again uh, for World Food Day. Uh, also called World Hunger Day in Sweden in October. And all in all, it was 150 people that traveled digitally to Kenya to visit the farmer uh, that uh, we support through a cooperative, cooperative there. And I must say that that's probably one of the best things we've ever done as far as I know and how I work for We Effect and Viagra Forestry. We've never been able to create so much dialogue and engagement from so many people with so little input. Uh, it was a lot of work, yes, uh, but it was still totally worth it. And the key learning here for doing a virtual visit with, with these people was basically not to overdo it, not be very technical. It was just uh, a visit where they were able to visit her farm. They, we walked around there, she milked her cow and it was very, very, um, common, not 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 uh, showcasing too too much. Just basically to being there, and then let I let people have questions. And I think uh, if I'm able to you open this link, you will be able to see a quick video here what it will what it looked like. I'm not getting any sound through, but maybe you can see it. I will start it from the beginning. Marcus, we don't see your screen at all. Ah, sorry. Let me see if I can. So are you only seeing my presentation? We just see the Facebook link. Uh, In the blue box. About... So it's not coming up? You might, you might need to change your share settings if you wanna then share and share your screen once again. Cause you might be sharing just one window. Yeah. Yeah, now it works. Now it works. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. But no sound. No, no sound. But maybe you'll be able to share the, the link of the video. Yes, so for sure. I can maybe afterwards. I can put the link uh, in the chat. Thank you. And what we also did here and what you can see in the below picture is that we have a studio built in our office. So we did uh, what we call the travel guides from these different companies that joined forces with us. Um, I'm not sharing that anymore. Uh, there we go. Are we back to the presentation now? Yes. Good. So basically what we, you saw there quickly, and I'm sorry about not getting the sound through, but was, was, was how, what, the, what, the, what the trip looked like. And another key element of that trip was that 
since we had 150 visitors, we decided to also have travel guides from these different companies that joined us. So the Coop, the food cooperative, the housing cooperative and so forth, they elected their own travel guide and they were in our studio at our head office in Stockholm, able to gather questions from their companies, colleagues and peers and to ask them live because having 150 people ask questions is a bit uh, difficult in, uh, in such a setting. So I've shared a few learnings and these are, I would say, uh, the, the, the key things to keep in mind if you would like to be inspired and do something similar to this is to be very clear on the purpose. Why are you doing these, this trip, this virtual visit? What goal do you have and who's the owner of different processes because it was sometimes unclear whether it was in Stockholm or in Kenya or in Guatemala who was doing what and that's something that was needed to be really really clear for everything to work and I would say even more important make contingency plan we had a virtual visit actually just two weeks ago ahead of the Stockholm plus 50 meeting again with parliamentarians and we did a, a, a dress rehearsal the day before the visit to the farmer that we had talked to for several weeks and everything was planned and there was no internet at her farm, no internet at all. And we were not able to go through with, 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 with the visit to that farm, but we had a backup plan. So we traveled to another farm, another cooperative, and there there was internet and we were able to do the trip as planned the day after. So that was, that was key to have a contingency plan and to also have recorded messages that you can put on if the live link is going down. And obviously you should recognize that the virtual visit is, is something new that you should be adding to your communication toolbox. It's not something that can add a normal visit, it's far from it, but it's still something new rather than just, just doing uh, a video that you're sending out to someone, let them be there live. So I would say that that's also a learning. And try to think about how you can talk to all senses. We used food, we have used music. There are other things and tricks that you can make sure as a communications expert, make sure that people really get the message that you're trying to send. Um, and when it comes to um, how you can also utilize this within your organizations, I think it's important to try to get virtual visits to become an alternative to physical visits within your own organizations. We were able to put it in our travel policy that it states clearly, if it's possible, choose digital visits over physical visits. Then you have a more of a in-depth discussion also about the impacts of physical travels on the climate. And you are able to be much clearer on the purpose of each visit. So a physical visit is, I think, very, very important to maintain. But when you do it, you should be clear you're not only going to a conference hotel because that could have been made virtually instead and again as i said before learn as you go along because these this is a development that you need to be just very open about uh so that's my presentation and i'll leave you with two questions um, how could these digital travels further the cost of your work and are digital visits worth exploring for you thank you very much There we go. Thank you very much, Marcus. It was a lot of fun to be on that trip together with you and, and to hear from your learnings. Um, feel free to, to chat to Marcus in the, in the chat box, uh, type down your questions. I will start by asking, when you started with these visits, what surprised you the most when we look at the impact they have had on decision makers or politicians or the board members? What, what uh, have you expected and what surprised you? The thing is, I'm an optimistic person. I, and I was one of the few that actually said that I think this is going to work. But a lot of people in our own office, in our communications department said, no, I don't think it's going to work. Uh, so I was surprised that it even did. I, I, I was definitely you know, willing to do one trip. But then after that, we just, well, it, I mean, it wasn't 100 percent. It was 70 percent. We still said, let's carry on, let's try it one more time. And I think that's, basically, I think what surprised me the most was that it worked. 
Uh, and I think that's when it comes to innovation. You, you don't know that. You need to be a little bit bold. You need to try things and you, be, you need to be ready for failure. If you're not if you're not up to, up to that, it's, it, you're not going to pursue it. So yeah, I think that's thank you. That was, that's what surprised me the most. That it actually worked. Uh, El McNay says, "How do you source camera teams, etc., uh, when working in remote areas?" Yeah, so basically, what we have done in Mozambique, for example, and and, and in Kenya, is that we have gone through a, a local communications uh, agency. Uh, with expertise of live uh, live broadcasts, and it's it's been a, a very very uh, I would say straightforward process where we have developed a brief. They've been able to respond to the brief. Do we understand you know the the task the same way? And then uh, we've had these uh, dress rehearsal visits, so we've been able to test things that it works and the internet has, has usually been the problem not how you do the actual like broadcast if you may say so or how you put the camera here or there that's never been a problem it's been the internet at all times but then it was quite funny actually in Nairobi they said you know we can get you one of those satellite buses that you see outside of the Olympics I'm like what yeah it will only cost you ten thousand dollars I'm like no we're a development organization we're not going to have a satellite bus run into a small village outside of Nairobi that's for many many reasons totally wrong but they were they were they were up to the task okay so and and what has been like the most difficult parts if if camera resources um and internet has been difficult but what else I think it's still getting through. I mean, you are still talking about being in your home setting, you know, like in a Zoom meeting. How do you actually go through? I, if I, we were in the same room right now, I would have seen the looks on your eyes. Maybe I would have seen a, a smile. I would have seen a nod or I would see, see someone falling asleep because I'm not making myself clear. And I think that's what's missing here is you don't get the full... Um, you don't get the full connection between people, obviously, and that's why you need to be so clear on 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 ex what what exactly do you want to show and what is the purpose of this trip. So you really nail it down to like this is the the, the essence of what you want to showcase. Uh, but because otherwise you get lost in translation, and uh, that's also what we've been hearing in the evaluations. It's like. They didn't really understand who was this farmer, why were they there, and there wasn't enough time to ask those questions. So you need to be very, very clear on the message. And I think that's it comes down to communications, right? You need to be very, very clear on your message, who you say it to, and, and what is the intention of, of that message. So And that translates, obviously, into virtual visits as well. All right, thank you. Uh, we have time for just one more question. Uh, Namrata says, what kind of budget did you need? Yeah, so the first trip with that we did was basically next to nothing. I would say like a thousand dollars. It was just like our comms consultant set up an international um, um, internet hub, and then we had uh, someone who edited something. But then for the biggest trip that we did now in the fall, the 150 people coming from Sweden, we had this Zoom portal built, and there was you know a lot of people involved. So I think I, I think we came close to maybe ten thousand dollars for that visit. Uh, but that should then be obviously seen in the light of what the normal visit for 100 people or, or even 10 people would have costed, which is much, much more. So it is expensive if you want to do it that large scale, but then you need to have the return of investment calculated from the start. I mean, we had a lot of engagement, a lot of donors come in through that trip, and it was easy for us to say that it's worth the money even before we did it. So I think that's, yeah, but around, around, that, around that figure. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Marcus, for sharing. Very interesting. Um, I will now move on a bit in the programs. And our next speaker, some thank of you. you might recognize him, Anders Salman, um, who was the moderator for the Communication Accelerator last year. Uh, he is here uh, in a little bit different capacity as presentation coach with more than two decades of experience from science communication. And um, he also has a parallel career working as an actor and a stand-up comedian and has gained him a lot of stage experience. And he is going to share this with us. He has already helped hundreds of science 
scientists and science communicators improve their presentations. And uh, we are looking forward to hearing what you have to say on this. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Jörl. Thank you for inviting me as well. And welcome to you all um, to this short workshop about crafting your message. Um, I will try to give you as much value as possible during these 20 minutes. So what I will tell you about is how to uh, craft a message or how to help someone else to, to cross, craft their message. And as many of you are already experienced communicators, you will probably already know about the concepts that I will mentioning, but you can regard this as a sort of a train the trainer session where you can learn some, perhaps some methodology, which you then can apply when coaching researchers or scientists in your own organization. So, as I said, this will be a very practical session, so please take out pen and paper and have it in front of you if you don't already have it. Because I will give you some exercises to do in front of your computer. And I think it will be of most value to you if you follow along with me uh, during this session. Okay? The, nothing complicated, nothing, nothing difficult. But I think you will get the most value of it uh, if you do it that way. So now if you use the reactions here in the menu and, and use the raise hand function, I would like to know how many of you have ever heard one or several boring presentations in your lifetime? Yes, I can see a, a lot of people agreeing there. Thank you very much. You can lower your hands there. Um, and how many of you know that you have ever made a boring presentation once or twice in your life. Yes, some hands are coming up there as well. And I want to thank you for your honesty because we've all been there, right? Yes, <laughs> I know. But um, let's ask ourselves what makes a presentation boring then? Well, in my, my opinion, as I have, as I think of it, I believe it's three things. But we only have time to talk about two of them right now. So f the first thing we do is we try to tell everything in chronological order. So we, we tell things in the order that we think is the most logical. So I think the main problem here is how the presentation is structured. Uh, later, I will give you a structure for a pitch or a presentation that you can use when you want to present, for example, a project that you've made. The th second thing is that we often include too much information. We try to tell the audience everything we know about a subject or, or about a project that we've done. And most researchers that I have met seem to have the mindset of when they're presenting that they I'm, I'm just here to tell as much information and, as possible and then the audience can decide what's important or not. But that is, of course, impossible because no matter what no matter what you are presenting, you are the expert in the room. So you have to do the work and choose what parts of your project are the most effective and interesting to tell the audience about. I think this is a strategy that is intended to avoid questions. I, we don't want to, the audience to sit and wonder ab about something that we've just said. Um, but on the other hand, when do we become most interested in something? Well, it's when we don't actually get to know everything. It's when you sit there and think and wonder, well, how did they achieve that? And what will happen now? So that's the goal. We want to ignite the other person's interest so that he or she starts asking questions and start thinking about your project. And for the sake of time, for this session, we will concentrate on the pitch. Uh, and as you probably know, a pitch is a very short summary of your research or your communication project. It's usually around 60 seconds or less. You've probably heard about the elevator pitch, right? But what is actually the goal of a pitch? Well, I like to think of it this way. A pitch is the start of a conversation. 
I think you can actually write this down. Write this down. A pitch is the start of a conversation. So what is the most interesting things that you can say that will lead to a conversation? That is something you should always keep in mind when doing a presentation. So for these exercises now, choose a project that you want to present. It doesn't matter what project it is. It doesn't matter if it's ongoing or if it's finished. But I think it's easier if you have something that you can use as a starting point, right? So I hope you everyone has chosen a project. Great. Because after this session, you will have three things. You will have a structure for a pitch or a presentation. You will have tools for creating that pitch or presentation. And you will have ideas for developing your pitch or presentation. And the way this will work is that I will ask you some questions. And you will get one minute to answer each question. But I don't want you to find to write down the perfect answer to each question because there are no perfect answers. Okay. Instead, I want you to write as many answers as possible, as many ideas you can think of, because the, this will get you the building blocks for creating your pitch. So uh, can we agree on this? I think so. Yes. So before we start with the questions, I promised you a structure that you can use, right? So remember when I said that one of the problems with boring presentations is the structure. Well, this is a suggestion for a structure that you can start to experiment with. And it looks like this. So first, you talk about the problem that your project or your research is contributing to solve. Then you talk about what are or will be the results of your project or research. Then you tell us about how you achieved those results or will achieve these results. And then you finish off with an action to the um, audience. And um, so everyone sees the structure. Great. Okay, so we will go through each part in detail. So um, the problem is actually, I mean, the overarching problem that your project wants to solve. Every project exists for a reason. So what is the project, the problem that your projects want to solve? Some people would say that this is the background. But by phrasing this as a problem, you'll actually catch the audience's attention more effectively. Because as soon as we learn as an audience that there is a problem to be solved, we immediately get interested. And when describing the problem, try to be as specific as possible. Use data, comparisons, analogies. You have to paint the picture in the audience's head, so exemplify instead of generalize. And if you don't see the PPT, it's because I show the text in my presentation windows. I do not share a presentation, right? So you have to look at where I'm actually doing uh, the presentation in my window. So now you will get one minute to write down as many suggestions for the question, what problem is my project contributing to solve starting now?
and that is one minute. So the next step is to talk about the results of the project. And when I say results, that might also include what effects your project uh, will achieve in the best of worlds. Because before we learn what you did in the project, we want to know what it will lead to. What is suddenly in the world that wasn't there before? So you can write this down for yourself. People buy results. They don't buy what you did, they buy the results of your work. Think of a shampoo um, um, commercial. They don't show you in the commercial uh, the factory where the shampoo is made and what ingredients they, they have to uh, make the shampoo. They show you what luscious and great hair you will get when you use the shampoo. So you sh they show you the results. So results can be in different kinds. They can be quantitative. We have trained 1,000 journalists. It can be qualitative. Um, 1,000 journalists have now gained more knowledge about uh, water issues. Uh, or they can be, as I said before, the effects of uh, your project. Now, 20% more articles about water issues have been published, blah, blah, blah. So what are or will be some of your results? in a perfect world, of course. One minute, write down as many suggestions as possible for yourself, starting now. You don't have to write the answers in the chat. Great, that's one minute. So now the audience knows about the problem you want to solve and what results you expect to get or have got. So now they ask the question, well, how did they achieve that? And with how, I mean, what are the most important activities you made to achieve your results? And as I mentioned before, how is actually the least interesting part. But this is often what researchers spend their most, most of their time explaining. And that is understandable, of course, because it's where they spend most of their working days in the daily lives. But as an audience, you only want to get a more general idea of what you did, because they can ask you more specific questions in the Q&A sessions uh, later on. So uh, write down as many answers as possible for, for what activities led to the results. One minute starting now. Okay, great. Now the last part is the action. Remember when I said that, that the pitch is the start of a conversation? Well, now it's time to start that conversation because most presentations end passively. There is a big thank you slide behind the speaker and they said, well, I think that's all for me and they go off stage. But how can you end the presentation in an active way? What do you want the listener to do when they've heard your pitch or presentation? What action do you want them to take? 
It can be a million, millions of things. Uh, a simple thing is to say where they can learn more about your project, uh, direct them to a website or, or where they can get in contact with you on social media or email perhaps. Or do you want them to do something else? Do you want them to donate to a cause or sign a petition or take part in a research project? Maybe you have a challenge right now that you would like to have some input on. Uh, if you're telling your, your pitch to a person in the coffee line at a conference, maybe you can finish with a question to get that conversation going. So there are millions of things you can do, but the important thing is not to end in a passive way. So write down for one minute as many suggestions as possible for the question, what do I want the listener to do now? Okay, so that was one minute. So now you have created several building blocks for your pitch. And these building blocks you can then expand to create one or several different pitches. But I will give you three things to, talk, to think about when you put the pitch together. So the first one is to write a script. If your pitch is 60 seconds or less, um, it's very valuable to write a script for this. It's the process of writing the script, I mean the choosing of what information to include and how to phrase it, that is very uh, valuable. Also, you know that you keep the time and it's much easier to go back and change the pitch after testing it out. But write the script as you talk, because we talk and write in very different ways. We write in long sentences, for example, but we talk in short sentences. So write as you talk. And to get you going, there are actually dictation tools that are available now that you get, can get you started. The second tip is to use a timer when practicing. With a timer, you know that the pitch is maximum 60 seconds long. But why not try to practice one of your regular presentations with a timer so you know that you will keep time next time you're presenting at a conference or another context. Because keeping time in your talk is the easiest way to look more professional. And the third and most important thing is to test your pitch or your talk. Because no good presentation is created in a vacuum or in an office. You have to go out and test it and get feedback from many people. And then you can go back and change. And each time you do the pitch or talk, it will improve. But if you ask a friend or colleague for feedback, don't just ask them, well, uh, what did you think? Because they will probably say, well, it was good. Um, and instead, ask them to retell your presentation in their own words. Because that will give you much more information about what they actually learned and where they got stuck. So ask them to retell your presentation. Okay. Uh, time is running out, it's time to wrap up, but I would like to encourage you to try writing the first draft of your pitch today. Set the timer for 10 minutes and write the first draft. It will probably be very bad, but that's really good, because you have something to improve upon. And that's the way to improve as a speaker, because every time you do a presentation, you should try something new. It doesn't have to be big, but try to do something new and evaluate how it worked afterwards. Because these small experiments, experiments will then accumulate into experiences that over time will make you a better speaker. So I'd like to thank you for engagement during this workshop and for Siwi for inviting me. I will stay on for the Q&A session, of course, but before you leave uh, or I leave, uh, I'd, last, I'd like to ask you for three things. Please write a sentence in the chat about this, your impression about this short workshop or what your takeaway, because that will help me a lot to improve.
And you are more than welcome to uh, connect with me uh, on um, uh, LinkedIn or, or email if you want to learn more about presentation skills in general or how to coach researchers on, the, on uh, presentation skills. And if you thought this was valuable, you can take a screenshot and tell about the workshop in your social media. But for now, I would like to take any questions that you uh, might have. And uh, uh, thank you very much for your attention and your engagement during this intense session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anders, for your very valuable presentation techniques and how to structure a pitch. Uh, I think we all learned a lot. Uh, fire away with questions to Anders, write down uh, in the chat. I'll see if there are questions. Uh, Reva says, wonderful. Thank you for this valuable presentation. Useful on structure inside, as I uh, as think I would have usually put the how before the results. Yes, and that's the usual way of doing it. But as I said, this structure and these questions are tips and tricks to get you engaged, to experiment with how to improve your presentation. So you have to go out and test it. Mm, exactly. And I think testing is a very good thing. And as I said, you are more than welcome to use this technique when you are coaching, for example, researchers in your in your presentation. I said, I saw that someone um, uh, got, got their brain racing with the limited time. And that's exactly the idea. Because when you have a very limited amount of time, you don't have time to think about it too much. You just jot something down. And that's important to get you started with something. Yeah. And we have ideas here for intellectual properties. Thank you, Anders. Takeaway, having to produce with a limited time, got my brain racing. Yeah, that's what we just spoke about. Uh, we got Anders LinkedIn here. Here we are. May you please let us know what software did you use for the presentation? That's ah, the yes. question from Reva. <laughs> Well, uh, you can learn more about that in my presentation next week about digital presentation techniques, but uh, there are various uh, ways you can do this. I have a, a, a video mixer, so it's a box before me that I can change uh, channels on, but there are softwares as well. One common and free software you can use is called OBS. OBS. I think it stands for Open Broadcasting Software. It has a bit of a learning curve, but then you can uh, make different scenes and change your presentations and mix uh, with your camera um, uh, in various ways. Right. Thank you for that. OBS, right? OBS. Yes. Uh, shall we write that? Oh, you talk more about it next week as well. Yes. Yes. And uh, for all of you who are present this week, don't forget next Thursday, because then we will have part two of Anders. Uh, we have also in the chat. Uh, thank you, Anders. Um, this was very inspirational. I realized that I'm not clear because I want to get my community. Very good. See if I have more questions scrolling down. I can just mention something about we haven't touched upon, but that what I think is the third thing that improves the presentation, that is, of course, the performance. Um, and um, the, uh, I mean, there are lots of rules that you can learn about how to perform on stage. And I can tell you lots of rules, but the main takeaway is that if you just follow the rules, it will become very boring because then you will just look at someone who is following the rules and doing everything correctly. What people want to see when you go up on stage is actually your personality. So think if you've seen TED Talks, they never look the same because each one is adapted to the speaker's own personality and the speaker's own subject. And this is perhaps the most difficult thing to learn. How can I show something of some of my personality traits on stage? So that's uh, um, uh, very valuable to, to get feedback on that as well from someone who is experienced in those uh, areas. I wanted to ask you a totally different question if you have time. Um, yes, but as long as it has with presentation skills to do. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, no. I mean, you have taught and been coaching hundreds of scientists. Um, 
And what are the most, like, I know you, you, you've told me it, it's so much fun to do this. Um, what makes it so fun? What makes it challenging with, with talking about research scientists, science communication? Uh, well, first of all, when I am out coaching scientists and researchers, I learn so much, not just about the subject itself, but it's sort of the connection and how it affects the world. So there are a lot of important and good research that deserves to be better communicated. That's sort of what I believe uh, we have to do. But I think uh, the most important thing to do is to inject confidence in researchers that they actually can communicate their subject in an interesting and engaging way. And what you have to realize is that Re the culture of a researchers is very different from when performing uh, on stage because the culture of a researcher is uh, is writing uh, articles and you can't say anything in an article uh, without having the right references and without sort of being judged by the other scientific community but you have to make get them to realize that it's a completely different uh, subject when you stand on stage because then you are the expert and your job is to choose uh, what important things about your research can you tell this particular audience about and it doesn't matter if you don't include everything about your research in it. I, I think Neil deGrasse Tyson, a famous astronomer as, uh, or cosmologist, uh, <laughs> a, a space researcher in, in the stage says it says it's very good. It's not about simplifying, it's about being effective with your audience. I think that's a very good takeaway message. And we have a question from Blanca here who says, how do you introduce yourself at the beginning? Well, I made it very easy for me. I let Joral do the introduction. <laughs> I sent you some lines before, so then I could not waste time on that and just start directly in the, uh, in the beginning. Uh, so there are various ways of, of introducing yourself, but don't make it too long. Because oftentimes we spend too much time in the beginning with thank you for inviting me, well my name is blah 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 and I work at this organization when we do blah blah blah. And then you have lost people's interest uh, um, immediately <laughs> almost. So try uh, to have something in the beginning that sort of catches the audience's attention, perhaps a question. Have you ever thought about why blah 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 blah? So you catch their attention and then you can save the presentation uh, a bit later on in your talk. Great. Abdallah also has a very good and interesting question. Um, he has been working on time management and been trying to time himself, but he says he keeps on failing. So how, how as a speaker, how do you deal with time and don't get panic when you're present with when you're doing your presentation? Yeah, and that's where the script comes in. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a script, you know, you know where you are going and how you are going to phrase it. Because uh, it's difficult to practice timing without having a script. And you don't have to uh, write a script for an hour presentation. Start with writing a script for five minutes uh, and try to see if you keep those five minutes. Because those five minutes will get you an idea about how long five minutes is. And that will get you a sense of time. I mean, in stand-up, when I do stand-up, we usually have very precise amounts of time to go on stage. You have 10 minutes, you have six minutes, you have seven minutes. And if we go over time, we don't get booked the next time because keeping time is really important. So as a stand-up comedian, you get really good at knowing how long your material is. And that is because we have it written down as a script. Ah, that's very good. And I think we can all learn from that as well. We have uh, another question here. Uh, keep failing. Yes. There is, this is a question from Nanda, uh, slightly on, on maybe on, on that panicking note um, or, or getting out of breath. Uh, whenever presenting something, I become out of breath, not being afraid, but just short of breath. How can I overcome this? And I guess there's practice methods. Yes, it is practice. And, and um, it helps a lot if you have practiced your 
presentation thoroughly before so that you know where you are going so you have that sort of in Rygmarian, what's it called in English? <laughs> uh, well, it's in it's, your It's sort of in blood. your body rather yes. than in your head. Uh, uh, because when something is in your body, you immediately get, get more calm. Um, and also there are breathing techniques to, to learn. So before you go up on stage, just try to take three deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. mouth. In through your nose and out through your mouth three times and see that you are more grounded and then you can just uh, repeat the first things that you are going to say, the, the first three sen sentences of what you are going to say, and that will get you a head start, a, ca a calmer start. That's very good. Okay, we are running out of time. I have yes. time for a very, very quick question, so we can do that live. Um, it's a quick question, basically yes or no. Um, Toby? Uh, sorry about mispronunciation your name as ask can one start with findings of research rather than methodology when uh, immediately on stage so basically yes or no yes you can i mean what i've learned is um the best stories i get is when i ask researchers so what gets you most engaged about the research your research, because then I, we get the story about the grandmother who passed away from cancer, and that is why they 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 do this research or or visits they have made in countries where where people are suffering and want, they want to do something, and it's very very the best thing is to just start with that. Start by telling you telling the audience why gets what gets you most engaged about your work. That will catch them immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. We do have some more questions. I will uh, copy those and uh, write them down to you. And maybe you can just give a line or two in writing and I will share it with the group. And Andres is back next week for more tips and tricks of presentations. So uh, we will see you then. Thank you very much for coming and for a very inspiring session. Uh, thank you very I, much for inviting me. Thank you. Um, I will now invite Charles Wendo. Uh, Charles Wendo, science journalist and training coordinator for, for SciDev.net. Uh, Charles is going to tell us more about how to make water science interesting to journalists and their audience. So welcome and over to you, Charles. Great. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, uh, depending on where you are. We are going to talk about how to make water science interesting to the media and their audiences. I think we all know that it's a terrible thing to be ignored. It's a terrible thing to talk to someone who is not listening to you. It's uh, not such a nice thing to issue a press release and no one, uh, no journalist writes a story out of it. So we have some ideas that we can, that we can share. And I like to make it. I like to make it a, a discussion because I believe wisdom is widely distributed in the room. I will. Uh, my name is Charles Wend. I'm the training coordinator with uh, SideNet, and um, part of my training is part of my job is to deliver training to the to the to the to journalists to communication specialists and to, uh, to journalists, communication specialists, and to researchers. So we talk about making water science interesting, but I will bias you a little bit. I know that the definition of water is quite broad. So I will bias you a little bit into thinking about the definition of water, uh, definition of science in terms of um, scientific research, because we know that whatever we know about scientific knowledge, uh, comes from scientific research and then it's documented eventually as established knowledge. So uh, when I talk about how to make research findings interesting, everything I say is equally applicable to the broader uh, communication of science. Now that is part of the introduction. Uh, SciDevNet is the leading source of news and analysis on develop, uh, developing development issues for the global south. And then um, the training arm of SciDevNet is called Script. So I'm, 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 um, uh, I'm, I'm part of the training arm of, 
of CyBev, which is called Script. Now, I thought I would begin with my story, my personal story. Uh, how did I become? How did I become a science journalist? And I like to tell this story whenever I'm delivering a talk on how to make science interesting because it is directly related to that. I trained in veterinary medicine. I graduated as a veterinary doctor. I did some veterinary practice and research. And then one day I bumped by chance into something called science journalism. And this is how it happened. We all know about this water weed. It's called water hyacinth. Now, Lake Victoria, which is the largest, um, the largest uh, lake in Africa, actually the biggest fresh water body in Africa, and one of the biggest in the world, really, uh, was choking. Um, water hyacinth had covered 80% of the lake, and it was a problem that bothered, it was a problem that bothered everyone in, in, in my country, Uganda, where I live. So one day I decided to think about the, uh, everyone looked at it as a problem. And I thought, well, uh, maybe this might be a resource. Is it possible that lush as it looks, green as it looks, beautiful as it looks, is it possible that it might be feed for livestock? So um, now I thought about those questions before my graduation at the, at the time when I was supposed to do my undergraduate research. So I decided to collect the literature that was the question I was uh, trying to answer. Is water hyacinth possibly uh, a feed for livestock and what might be the feeding value? Now I collected my literature and I did not have the money to do that research. So I shelved that literature and I carried out some other research that was uh, research on another topic that was more affordable. So one day about a year into my, uh, into my after my graduation, I went back to the literature that I'd collected on water hyacinth and shelved. So based on that literature, I wrote an article for the newspaper and the main, main focus of the article was that this weed might, might be useful as, 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 as livestock feed, but we need to do more research on it. So I wrote that article and the editors at the newspaper who I'd never met before, I didn't know anybody at this newspaper, they got excited about this article and they immediately published, they immediately published the article. Uh, at that time, water hyacinth was such a big problem. It was uh, affecting fisheries. It was affecting um, uh, water transport. It was affecting uh, beach going because it compromised everyone's, uh, everyone's life. So it, it was a, a matter of concern. The editors received this article, immediately published it, and to cut the long story short, uh, as a result of that article, I became that article that I thought was going to be a one off. I became a science journalist because the editors then encouraged me to continue writing because they told me they were interested in publishing science articles on science, but, but they, they had a shortage of journalists that could write articles that, that were referring uh, to scientific research, scientific information, but presented in a way that could easily be um, understood by the by their audiences. So that article turned me into, into a science journalist. One thing led to another. I carried out for, uh, for my postgraduate studies were in, 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 uh, in mass communication and step by step I became what I am today. Now I would like, I mentioned earlier that I would like to make this as interactive as I can. Uh, I would like us to use the Zoom chat uh, think again about that water hyacinth story that I've just told. Please type in, please type in, what do you think made the water hyacinth so interesting that the editors published it immediately? Why do you think this art for one space immediately? I would like to hear your views. Uh, let's make it a, a session for sharing ideas. I think I've seen a message coming. Yes, uh, it provided a new solution to an existing problem. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, it had a real life application. Uh, in other words, it had value for the audiences. 
Great, great, great. Thank you for that. It was relevant and timely. Timely, yes, yes, that is very, very important. Relevant and timely. Great, great. Uh, it was a problem that affected many people. Great, wonderful. Uh, real life application, we've already read that. Uh, it, it, uh, okay, great. Thank you, thank you for all. Yes, another comment here is water hyacinth was a topic of interest to many groups. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you for all of these comments. Yes, and all, all of these comments, you are all right. And then another comment has come in, probably because people saw another use for water hyacinth and economic opportunities. Great, 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 thank you, thank you for all of these, uh, thank you for all of these comments. Now, let us proceed. Now, uh, in my views, and these views are similar to the views that we have just expressed, uh, the editors liked this because it addressed a problem that the public was concerned about at that time. Everyone was concerned about it. It doesn't matter whether you were what, uh, someone who traveled on water or someone who just loves eating fish or someone who loved going to the beach, you were affected one way or another. Then uh, it presented a unique perspective to the water hyacinth problem by discussing it as a potential resource when most people looked at it as a problem. You know, it was a unique, a unique, a unique, uh, a unique angle, a different kind of story from what they have always had. Then it provided credible information, useful information. Uh, I think someone uh, had a comment on the user value. Yes, it was providing potentially useful information and uh, citing, citing credible uh, scientific sources. And above all, this article was presented in, uh, it was presenting scientific information in a simple language that, uh, that non-specialists could, could, easily, could easily understand. Great, uh, let's proceed. Uh, let's proceed. I thought about projecting this figure there because someone might ask, why should we bother making science interesting to people who are not scientists anyway? And we know why scientific research is done. At the end of the day, you would say scientific research is done for the good of society. Uh, I, I, I usually ask researchers, why do you do scientific research? And they give me 10 reasons why they do scientific research. And I summarize all of it. You ultimately want to make society a better place. That is why scientific research is done. But if scientists operate in isolation, this is not possible. So I create here the link between researchers, the media, policymakers, and the public. And uh, you may know this, but it's, it's, uh, it's good to talk about it for emphasis. Uh, the scientists carry out scientific research. Uh, I would rather say researchers because some of the researchers are not in the natural sciences. I think we have both, we have scientific researchers in both the natural sciences and in the social sciences. So the researchers carry out research they create knowledge, then the media disseminate this knowledge to the policymakers and the public who are going to ultimately act upon this information. Uh, the public, we may make personal decisions uh, based on this information, and then the policymakers may make policy decisions based on this, uh, uh, based on the knowledge that is coming from scientific research. We know that it's not exactly as simple as that. Sometimes there are so many complex social factors that determine whether people adopt and make use of uh, the knowledge that is coming out of scientific research. But this is ideally what, uh, what the relationship is. Now, it's good to keep in mind that when we are going to communicate about research. Then the other thing I wanted to point out is that think about this, um, this communication cycle, which you probably might be already familiar with, but again, I project it here because I want to emphasize something that when we communicate about research, we need to think about this person at the other end called the receiver. It doesn't matter whether we're just writing a press release, whether we're preparing a brochure, whether whatever we are doing to communicate um, science, ultimately there's, there are real human beings at the other end going to receive this information. So a press release is not simply a press release. Uh, every word that we write into this press release, we should be thinking about real human beings who are at the end, the other end, going to receive this information. So it is therefore uh, very, very important. And now the media are likely 
to report on research findings if they consider it interesting, important, and timely enough to draw the attention of their listeners, viewers, and readers. Again, so the people you think when you write a press release or whatever communication you're releasing through the media, the real people at the other end who are going to read the newspapers, watch TV, listen to radio, we need to think about those people. What is it that they consider important to their lives? Because we do not have, we have very few people in society there who are looking out for the latest findings of scientific research. Most people are going on their businesses and if they will pay attention to you, only if the research findings that you are talking about are related to the things that are important to them. Uh, uh, if, is it going to help them or is it related to, to, to their daily lives in any way, then they are likely to pay attention to you. Apart from this small uh, number of people who are looking out for the latest scientific research, the majority will only pay attention if, if, if whatever you're communicating connects with them, if it's related to their own lives, if they consider it relevant to their own lives. Okay, let's proceed. Now, there are certain techniques which I'm going to look at very quickly. And uh, I will, I'm trying my best to talk about these in 20 minutes. It's the kind of thing that I normally handle in a two hour session. So if uh, it's inevitably it's going to miss some of the learning activities that we normally would have if we had our full two hour session. And one, you need to prioritize research findings that are of interest to the public. Uh, and I, uh, I will talk about that in a short while. Then you need to identify a window of opportunity when the topic is on most people's minds. And then you need to know how to humanize the research findings. And then you need to relate those findings to people's most pressing needs. We are going to look at these in a little bit more uh, in a little bit more detail, one by one. One is uh, how prioritize research findings that are of interest to the public. Now, I point out here that not all research findings will be of interest to the media policymakers and the public. Naturally, people will want to hear something that can relate with and that they can understand. So therefore, it's important to think about the people you are communicating with and then this enables you to select information that is of interest to them. So how do we then know what is of interest to, to what's of interest to most people? Now, I need to emphasize here that there are certain research findings that are purely of interest to the researchers or to the academicians or to specialists in that area. And then there are certain research findings that are of interest and applicable to policymakers and the public. I would emphasize, I would spend more energy communicating research findings that are of interest to the public and policymakers if I'm communicating through the media. Okay, and um, again, I thought I would project that figure there. Uh, uh, usually there's an intersection between the research findings and the interest of the public. So you use that intersection as the entry point for any initiative to communicate to the public about scientific research. Because if you start with the things that then, there are things that researchers consider as very important, but the public consider them as not, you know, don't consider them as important. So if you start with those ones that are of um, interest to the scientists, then you lose the, the public. So how do you know what is of interest to the public? I just put this here to remind you, I know that most of you already know about the news values, the issue of novelty, timeliness, significance, proximity, uh, the, the, the surprise element, uh, prominence and controversy. I think most of you already know this, uh, novelty is something will, people are more likely to be interested in it if it's new. You, if you're providing something new that, you know, if you, are, you have a revelation, you are revealing something new that they never heard about. Uh, timeliness, if it's related to something that they're concerned about around that time. Significance, um, you know, some people would call it impact. Uh, how many people does it affect and to what extent does it affect them? Proximity, how closely are, likely, are people likely to feel close to, 
you know, to the issue. And then the surprise, uh, it's the unusual, uh, what, is, what is different from the usual. Then prominence, is it related to a prominent person? And uh, controversy, does it stir some debate or argument? Now, these you all know. Again, I would like to ask a question before we proceed. How many of these do you identify? Remember again, the water hyacinth story that I talked about. How many of these, which one of these news values? Uh, uh, type just one or two or three, uh, rather than the full word. Okay, I've seen some questions already coming in. Okay, uh, I'm going to go to the end first, then we come to, to discuss the, the questions. Okay, novelty, yes, because it was new. Uh, significance, yes, this, this, this lake is a lake that affects many people. Proximity, yes, proximity, uh, because people feel concerned about the lake. It's, it's our biggest, uh, you know, it's one of the biggest, it's the biggest, uh, one of those biggest physical features in one of the biggest water bodies in Africa, really. And especially people in Uganda associate so much with the, with the lake. So proximity, yes. Timeliness, yes, because people were concerned about it at around that time, uh, yes. Uh, controversy, I'm not so sure about controversy. There may be some controversy, yes. Uh, the unusual, yes, because people talked about it as a problem and here you are presenting a solution. There might be some controversy to the extent that some people will say this is a water weed, we should focus on destroying it as opposed to identifying the value in it. Yes, that is possible. Uh, the surprise element, yes, that is also true. Um, yes, uh, the, the media outlet you chose could be close to the area affected. Uh, in fact, it's just a few kilometers. The office of this media outlet is just a few kilometers from the, from the lake, so you're right. Uh, probably six, uh, probably six, seven, eight, not, not more than 10 kilometers from the lake, so you're right. Okay, great, so let's proceed, let's proceed. Technique number two is to identify a window of opportunity when the issue is on most people's minds. Again, uh, when you look at the story of uh, water hyacinth in Lake Victoria, that story came in at a time when there was, it was a window of opportunity. You know, when there's a problem and then people's minds are focused on that problem. Now, uh, an issue, it may not necessarily be a problem. It may be a problem or a good thing. Uh, natural events, organized events, a trending topic on social media, a popular news item in the mainstream media, a relevant time of the year, a critical time in the policy cycle, uh, major international dates like World Water Day. All these provide you with an opportunity uh, to communicate about a topic because um, uh, they make people uh, interested in listening because it will be on their minds, the issue may be on their mind. So if you bring in new information related to something that is on people's minds, they are most likely to pay attention to you. And then technique number three, humanize the research findings, humanize the research. One of the ways to humanize the research is to tell a remarkable and informative story about a person or people involved. And these people could be heroes, they could be villains, they could be beneficiaries, they could be victims. Uh, human stories, we all like to hear human stories. Um, we, we all listen when we are told human stories. Now, if the study involves, uh, if the study involves focus group discussions or interviews, you can tell the story of some of the people interviewed but I point out here that informed consent is needed to, to do this. And then interpreting research findings in relation to the things that really matter to people. In other words, you don't just present research findings, but you talk, you tell people what this actually means to them. Does it change anything uh, about their lives and about how they should, uh, they should go about their lives, how they should do things? on a day-to-day -day basis. And finally, the other technique that I talk about is that um, um, uh, people are more likely to listen to research findings related to the things that they care about, such as uh, 
such as money, such as food. And again, I am going to ask you a question, but first I will give you some examples that a community that faces hunger will most likely pay attention to news about food. Isn't that right? Uh, someone carried out a study, I cannot remember exactly where, that showed that journalists are likely to report on global warming. They are likely to do, more likely to do stories on global warming on the days when they feel hot, when the weather is hostile to them. So people are more likely to pay attention uh, when it is related to something that, that is affecting them at that moment. Uh, so a community facing hunger will more likely listen to news about food. People in a re, uh, living in a region with adverse climatic events are more likely to listen to weather information as opposed to people who are having comfortable uh, weather conditions. News about technology that saves energy will attract more attention in a society where energy is more expensive and perhaps in limited supply. That's, that's, the, that's the way it works. Now, I will ask you a question in a, in a, in a moment that what are the most pressing needs of the people in your community? What are the most pressing needs of the people in your community? Is it food? Is it, uh, is it food? Is it, um, is it money? Is it, uh, is it, uh, is it jobs? Uh, give me just one, just one using the Zoom chat. Food, jobs, water, yes, yes. Food, jobs, water, yes. Affordable housing, yes. Uh, cost of living, yes. Oh, not only in the UK, right now, uh, I think the whole world, a lot of people are concerned about the cost of living. In recent, uh, in recent weeks, the cost of living has gone up in Uganda, and I think many other countries. Yes, drought, yes. Uh, yes, need to complain, yes. Uh, maybe you mean mechanisms for addressing their complaints. Yes, that is true. Uh, drought, yes. Uh, uh, have I missed some? Affordable housing, jobs, food, water. Yes. Great, great, great. All these are important. Inflation, yes. Inflation, yes, yes. Sanitation, yes. Access to toilets, yes. That is very important. Uh, access to water, yes. Access to water is very important. Food, education, yes. Education, people care about access to education. People also care about the cost of education and also the quality of education. Uh, all over the world, I think people do. Uh, safety, yes, people care about personal safety. That's very important to us. We care about jobs. Uh, we care about jobs. We care about war. We care about uh, great, great gender equality and so on and so on. All right, all right. Climate change, yes, yes. All these are things that people care about. And all I'm trying to say here is that when you're going to, if you're going to communicate about scientific research, bear in mind these many things that people care about. Relate, relate, relate this, relate your research findings to the things that people care about that you have uh, very effectively listed here. And very finally, I'll place a summary that uh, research findings related to an issue that most people are concerned about presented in a simple language and presented at the right time will be attractive to the media and the public. You will not need a lot of lobbying for this kind of information to be published in the media. Then you need to show the media policymakers and the public that your research findings are interesting, important, and timely enough for them to pay attention to you. And I will just mention here, these are uh, opportunities for further learning. We, if, if you go to, I mentioned that we do training. Uh, they, there's not a lot that we can uh, talk about in 20 minutes, but there's a lot of opportunities. We have free online courses on communicating science. Also, we have a number of practical guides there on uh, related to communicating science. And uh, we, 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 we also encourage or uh, uh, facilitate networking sessions between the media and uh, between the media and uh, scientists. So that is all that I had time Thank for. Thank you. Thank My you. apologies, I overshot by a couple of minutes. Thank you, Thank you Charles. Uh, we still have uh, for, we have one more question, if you can give a very quick answer. Um, and Tobachukwu from Nigeria says, in communicating research findings, 
does language differ example is when you are writing to scientists or an ordinary public do you write do you use different languages yes different yes yes the audience matters a lot the if you are communicating to researchers you wouldn't bother going especially research, researchers in the same field you wouldn't bother going through through everything that we have explained about how to make it interesting because they are already specialists in that field they are already interested so you don't have to go out of your way to make it interesting to them but also secondly you don't have to go out of your way to make it understandable to them because they they, they understand all the complicated scientific language if you are communicating with the public then you need to break down the information in two language that they can understand. Thank you. Thank you very much for a, a great and interactive session. I think that's very much needed this time in the afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining us, Charles. It's now uh, time for me to introduce the last two speakers, actually, uh, for this next session. Uh, we have uh, Dennis Walter, uh, Watch Project Coordinator, Viva Con Agua, and Norbert Latin, uh, Coordinator, Viva Con Agua Gaming. And you're going to talk to us about the universal languages, how to use the universal languages of sports, arts, music, and game to convey a message. And I leave the rest to you. Welcome to the Communications Initiative. Thank you for the introduction and the, the welcome. All right. A warm welcome, everybody, to our session titled Wash Again with a Purpose presented by myself, Dennis Bolter, and Norbert Latim. And I'd say let's uh, get straight into it and give you a little taste of Viva Con Agua and our work. We have a little video that I'd like to show. This is Viva Con Agua. brief impression on how we work and where we work, uh, mainly projects across Africa and uh, South Asia. What we mainly believe in and what's most important for us is uh, positive transformation, joyful learning, and uh, yeah, making a positive difference. And from the beginning, Viva Con Agua has been trying to rather focus on the positive aspects and using these universal languages for uh, behavior change and positive societal transformation. Um, so, so today we will talk about the universal languages approach for behavior change in short, in short UL4BC. We particularly look into the watch game that's been a board game that's been uh, in the development for some good two years now. And nobody is going to talk about um, how we are currently building gaming communities um, for the topic of wash. Here, a snapshot of our works and some more insight uh, about the universal languages for behavior change. In the beginning, it was mainly about arts, music, and sports. And now I'd say gaming is becoming the newest member of the family. That also includes, of course, everything from poetry, dance, um, murals, sketches, even comics, as you can see here in the center, a comic that was prepared um, alongside or in, in line with a project in South Africa. Um, I'd like to talk about the WASH board game in a bit more detail. It's a strategy game for systemic water and sanitation planning, and we call it a not so serious WASH game. Why a not so serious WASH game? Because serious games are usually characterized by the educational character and learning objective and the edutainment and fun is usually, uh, it comes second, it's not the primary purpose. 
And uh, this is also mainly due to the fact that these serious games are most of the times uh, developed uh, by, by sector experts in a certain field, which makes it very academic. And from the beginning, of course, we had uh, a lot of Walsh knowledge going into it. But for the past couple of months, we've been mainly focusing on tweaking and adjusting the, um, the game mechanics so that it's actually more, more fun and joyful. So we are actually trying to challenge this and create uh, a serious game that is mainly fun and the learning comes in it, so to say. And that's also um, yeah, what the headline of this slide is talking to, that good games bring the learning into the fun and not the fun into the learning. Um, generally, positive emotions make learning by playing very efficient. And this knowledge is very easy to remember because it can easily be connected while playing the game and having fun. It also connects abstract knowledge with everyday life. Of course, we have to strip down a little bit on the realities of it, but in that actually the relatability increases by far. It also provides a perfect balance between stimulation and active recreation. And uh, some important research findings are shown below, which is also known as the forgetting curve, where we are aware that a board game like this is not able to transfer as much knowledge as a university lecture, for example. But after already a short period of time, there's actually proof that uh, participants or players or listeners are actually remembering more from a game like this than from a university lecture. And that's our main selling point, I would say, where we are providing uh, sustainable learning outcomes that are not forgotten in a week or two. The game is, as already mentioned, using the universal languages for behavior change. And generally, the UA4BC approach is used for communication and training uh, purposes. In this particular case, a training tool to foster systems thinking in a joyful way. Apart from the training, the game has a second main goal, which is to generate revenue, because we actually aim to publish the game through a game publisher on the commercial market. And revenues generated through the sales which we predict to happen mainly um, probably in the in the European board game market. We will use those revenues to then finance workshops using this tool, tool in, in our uh, projects, with which we also have a very nice yeah, story and connection to tell, where people know if you buy this game, you're actually playing the same thing that other people are actually using as a training tool. The idea started uh, mainly in the yeah, in the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, already in March 2020, so some good two years now. And by now we spent well over 600 hours of development and testing work and reiterations in a total of seven iteration loops. And we did uh, well over 25 test playing sessions so far, the seventh um, development loop actually in testing right now. Um, the game was also developed with input from watch experts, but also a lot of input and feedback from game developers and what we've seen in the test play sessions. The most valuable feedback usually came actually from people who are not watch experts themselves. They just had a bit of an interest in gaming and they were able to give a bit more, how can I say, distant input and not too, too much focused on on the academic aspect and the and the real the reality aspects of the game. Now I would like to hear uh, your opinions and experiences in gaming and also serious gaming. We prepared uh, a little survey. It's only two questions for now on Mentimeter. You can just go on menti.com and enter this code that Cecile will also post into the chat. And we will see while I will share my screen on the on the results so you can find the code on top of the slide here and you can also um copy the copy the code from the chat we just leave this running for a good minute or one and a half maybe um before we go back into the presentation Okay, the answers are coming in. So we see here by our visitors group, there is some exposure to serious games, but it's definitely not something that has been 
mainstreamed or applied in many different contexts. And so far, that's quite interesting. No one who, who says that uh, they used serious games multiple times. So we hope we create the best serious game so far that people will, will, will play it uh, in workshops and even take it home and, um, and play in their spare time. Okay, we can also share the results afterwards. You can still keep on keep on voting. I will keep track of that, but then I would also slowly get back into the presentation. A little bit deeper into the game. Uh, the game is designed for two to four players and the playing time is designed to be around two to three hours which is a longer playing time, yes, but compared to other complex uh, strategy games on the market or generally strategy games is actually well in the, in the middle or well on average. The game is played in rounds. We have a maximum number of 12 rounds and each round is projected to take around 15 to 20 minutes, uh, rather on the shorter side when players are a bit experienced. Um, we have quite a number of intended learning outcomes. Firstly, it's simulating real life, although in a simplified version, but players deal with the complex decisions to achieve wash outcomes and have to develop uh, strategies. And for that, we have different technologies for water supply and sanitation services, and particularly their applicability in different settings and contexts. Players have to balance between public health, environmental protection, and economic viability of wash services. And there's also a need to develop skills and capacities uh, for service delivery. And overall, we apply a district-wide planning approach with systems thinking that includes a multi-level stakeholder engagement approach for inclusive and holistic planning of WASH services. Here you can see um, a picture of our current board game design. And uh, now how do we translate these, uh, these aims of the game into, into the gameplay, um, where we have different actors in the game that players slip into the role of. So we have a public sector, private sector, NGO, and the civil society, which all have different uh, characteristics with certain advantages in the gameplay. The map was initially uh, designed based on the city of Kigali, mainly because the city boundaries provide already all different types of landscapes within the boundaries namely low income areas, high income areas, industrial areas, uh, rural areas and mountainous areas. So now the players have to develop technical uh, solutions which are in the game uh, developed or researched through a bidding or auction process. And these technologies are applicable in different areas um, so that a certain technology can, for example, be built in the mountains but cannot be built in an urban environment, for example. The infrastructure uh, construction can also only happen when a certain skill level is achieved. And of course, they're also the more complex the technology, the higher the skill requirements for, for, um, for this technology. And uh, a winning strategy has to also address public health and, and the environment where we have different game currencies for health points and ecology points while providing sustainable wash services. So it's also important that uh, players generate some, some revenues. Um, lastly, to mention the players, it's a competitive game, but the players are highly encouraged to cooperate because no single player has the skills or resources to do to take up this task alone. Right now, what's been really working in our favor uh, we've been using the tabletop simulator to, to test the game. It's a digital em emulator of board games. And the big advantage is that right now we can test the game with players all around the world with the convenience of basically sitting wherever they are with a stable, stable network connection. That's all that is needed. Um, and it really helped us a lot to get perspectives um, from different players, not only having to print out prototypes from every version, but basically just adopting it and having a game session with people sitting in four different countries. That has really been um, a helpful experience. Um, there is, of course, also the chance to uh, develop an online version of the game, but currently the main focus is to use this digital tool um, for testing and then uh, develop a physical board game from that. I'd also like to show you a quick video on the controls, how this currently looks. The game design is not really furnished by a designer yet, 
but the uh, mechanics should be clear. So this is the, the auction process. I, in this case, as a civil society player, developed the rainwater harvesting uh, system. Usually it's a competitive process. Um, the blue cards are sanitation skills shown here because I have a water, uh, water skills, sorry. The water skills, because I already have a water technology, I'm also developing um, a, water, a water skill. I just rolled the dice for fundraising in this case, which gave me a revenue of 11 bill. That's the name of our game currency. And now I actually have the required skill level and the resources to implement this rainwater harvesting tank for which I place one of my victory point chips, these markers on the field, in this case, um, a rural area where rainwater harvesting can be placed. I pay uh, for this technology and get my, my chain from the bank. And now I can count my skill level and my victory points on my, my tally sheet. So this, as a very quick run through, through how the game and the different phases in the game work. Um, and now I would like to hear once again from you, there's another Mentimeter survey. Um, the, the code is shown here and I will show, share the results again. And Cecile will also share the, the code in the chat once again. So this one, second one, exactly 9396017. And into this. Okay, here are some of the results. There's also a second question that you can answer. I just see that we skipped that in the first one. Here we also have a question what do you associate with board games there you can basically just throw in throw in uh, tag words like joy fun family times friend times i don't know whatever comes to your mind i don't want to uh, pre predetermine your answers in this okay we have a few answers here play and purchase a wash themed board game board game Five answers. Some people rather say they would play it, but not necessarily purchase. But so far, no one has said that they wouldn't want to try it out. But I think we are also talking to a WASH audience here with touch points. So that makes sense. Family and friends, meditative. Okay, some results here. And I think I have one more slide on the game while we keep that going. This is a little insight on how we envision the, the training workshops. They haven't started yet, but we are preparing for that. We have a quite wide audience that we would like to target. Petitioners, public sector staff, secondary schools, colleges and universities, but also project stakeholders from the NGO and private sector. And the game in this case applies innovative learning approach where we will use the nine building blocks which is a sustainability framework that is funded and co-developed by Viva Con Agua. And it would work that we would play one round of the game and apply certain happenings in the game to specific building blocks after each. And then with this, we will, after each round, cover a different building block until we have covered all the nine building blocks. And with that, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Norbert, who will tell you more about our e-gaming initiatives. Thank you very much. Um... Gaming in Viva Conaba is a very recent thing. It started in 2020. It was a, a direct response, you could say, to the corona pandemic and the lockdown. Um, what the concept is, is not so different from, I'll, I'll call it for now, VCA proper, um, because VCA has a very huge network and a lot of what VCA, Viva Conaba is VCA, a lot of what it does is really revolving around having this very strong network. So the idea with gaming is not to go too far away from that because we know from experience that having friends and a huge network is what makes things work well or work faster or even more efficiently. So the first thing we want to do is build a network 
and also put ourselves out there. You can see when we go to the gamers, we tell them, hey, we'd like to be part of your community. And um, we, we are bringing with you our big community that's outside gaming. So when they see things like, or people like Ed Sheeran doing our oh, Water is a Human Right campaign or Pharrell Williams or Ma Manuel Neuer, then they, they know that, oh, we are coming into this, this nice community. Let's, let's exchange. Here is our gaming community. Bring us into your Viva Conagua community. Yeah. Um, next slide, please. And <clears throat> so the strategy is actually very interesting. If you, there's a, an author called Yukai Chow, he, he wrote a book called Actionable Gam Gamification. And in that book, he gives eight categories in which games are made. If you look at these categories, you will know exactly why, for example, when you play Candy Crush, you, you, you can't stop playing or it's all you think about. One of those eight categories is called scarcity. It means that the game intentionally gives you less lives so that you have that in the back of your mind and that category influences kind of addiction, so to say. And the strategy for us here is meaning and social influence. That means if you can sell people the idea that they are part of a something big, something with really epic meaning, so to say, then, then they will be with you on a very emotional level. If you can also tell them or bring them to influence them socially that you're part of a big community that is part of something big something meaningful you will really have them on not just an emotional level but also on a social level and this is the strategy i'm trying to use or we are trying to use here in gaming to offer them a big sense of meaning and a big sense of belonging to put it very simply yeah next slide please if if you've not read the book, I really encourage you to read it. It's very interesting because gamification is also considered human design. So in short, like you can also look at your life like a video game. Um, what are the, ins uh, the aspirations? I keep talking of VCA proper. Um, VCA proper, the network has become so huge with volunteers and musicians and artists that people have been motivated to the point that sometimes we don't ask for help or for certain things. Sometimes people come to us and say, I have this idea, let's do this. I have this event, come and be there. And this is what we are trying now to do with gaming, to create the network that believes in this vision that we have to the point that they are willing to <clears throat> activate their own communities by themselves. And when days like Wild Water Day or Wild Toilet Day come, they don't wait for us. They say, we, I have this idea, let's do this. And so this is what we really look, look forward to also on the gaming scene. Yeah. So finally, I've been talking a lot about the network, but we also do our own events. Um, we translate them to gaming. We've got, uh, for example, Run for Water, where we, where we try to translate the, the idea of people going for marathons, but putting it in, in the game or doing it in a game. We have um, a game, a child, FIFA events, for example. I don't know if you know the game FIFA. Um, there are events uh, which we develop from the ground up and go out to the communities and invite the people to come to us. So it's really exchange. We, we invite them, they invite us. So everybody kind of feels like it's not one is benefiting more from the other. And also ordinary gamers are invited to have their own ideas and do such events. So we also see ourselves as a platform for creativity. If you have an idea, let's do it. Yes, that's what I can say about gaming. Thank you. Thank you very much for being on the program. We have some questions. Uh, we, I'll start first. Um, we slightly touched on it um, before with the um, uh, online version. Uh, versus the the analog version and uh, you said Dennis you are at the moment only um, developing an analog version uh, it was Leonor who asked if you're also developing an online version but did you think about an online version or did you make decisions the pros and cons uh, online analog 
Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. And yes, this question comes up almost every time when we share a digital version of the game. The main difference is that the tabletop simulator is really a board game emulation and you can stick to the rules or you cannot. It's the same way in a physical game where if people don't stick to the rules of a monopoly game and just take out money from the bank, it's not going to work out. Now, in an online version, we would definitely need advanced um, AI or something that controls the gameplay and controls the rules, which would certainly require some major um, uh, IT coding coding skills. And for now, it's just not opening another uh, project on its own um, before we haven't fully developed uh, the mechanics for that. But it's definitely on the list. It's been asked before. We just need to see how we implement it because it would be nice if it's not just a copy of the board game, but something that is is sort of more engaging and maybe can also play some animation clips or something like that. But that again is a project on its own. But yes. Um, right. Thank you. Uh, Elle McNay says, how do you envisage sharing the findings, uh, successful strategies in the game with real world water policy makers? I mean, there's one important aspect, definitely inviting them to test the game themselves. That's, I think, already the most uh, practical learning experience. And they are also going into and, uh, and, and, and yeah, addressing the public sector in particular and hosting uh, game workshops or playing sessions with participants from these sectors. Generally, we will also participate in this year's World Water Week and showcase the game in different events and side events inside the, the, the conference space, but also outside of that. And generally, I can also already imagine um, writing an article or, or re yeah, a research article about that because I think there's already so many findings um, and one really interesting finding so far that makes us quite happy and proud um, so far, whenever we play the game, no game is the same. It always turns out to be very different, not slightly different, but very different. And in that, um, I think that's already one of the big things that we wanted to achieve to show that it's a complex topic. It's, it's not just, this is the strategy, this is how you win. Um, and there's uh, probably different channels on how to, how to share that. We just need to streamline the information that we can actually gather from, from that. Thank you. We, we have another question from uh, Leonor. How do you measure, or is it possible to measure, uh, the impact of, of your gaming initiative? Is that directed to me with a board game or, or uh, with Nobi? Or both? Both. Whoever feels like answering. Both. Okay. Leonor so, says both. Go for it. Since I'm already talking, just a quick one on that. We, Alongside with the game, we are also developing uh, an evaluation sheet or want to come up with an evaluation uh, methodology to, to track that. Um, it's, of course, knowledge and measuring knowledge is, is never easy, but we'll, we'll try and address that from the beginning so that already now also in the, in the test playing sessions, we send out a few questions before the game and a few questions after that. And we also want to continue with that in the workshops. Um, and uh, I think on the on the e-gaming, Norbert can say a few more words on that. Yeah, um, I think the first, not I think, but definitely the first things we we consider are donations. If if donations are not working, then the whole thing is not making sense because that's the whole point of it to raise funds for for um, the clean water projects. And of course, the other thing is followers these are the first first let me call it the surface level of what we can at least see immediately followers uh, the other platforms growing uh, is the um, engagement on those platforms growing as well because there's having i like to call them ghost followers or things like this and but beyond that i think we are still like i said a bit young to really see the long term can i call it impact but the things that that are really showing progress are, for example, that people we started working with or people we um, we collaborated with on events return. So that's definitely a good thing. Um, the overall funds are increasing in compa or 
gen, uh, donations generated are increasing in comparison to the first times we did it. So that's definitely positive growth. Um, the community is growing and not because of us, but because the existing community is recommending us further. We get a lot of um, um, people coming and saying, hi, uh, my, my name is so-and-so. I was, I was told about you guys from this person. And so that's also interesting. And of course, sponsoring is also there are companies that actually come and say, we would like to do this charity event with you. Um, what, what should we do? So, so far, that's how we measure it, mostly network and funds that are increasing. Um, All right, thank you. Uh, we have a, an encouraging shout here from Zoom user, um, complimenting your, your novel and interesting solution. And we have a question, last question of the day from Jason. How do you move uh, knowledge uh, building or playing the game into action? I mean, I guess that's the ultimate goal. That's, that's the ultimate goal, but also a very interesting question, but I think also not that easy to answer. I mean, firstly, I think it's uh, quite obvious that this game, playing one round of this game is not going to make you a wash expert. It's more of like uh, aiming to <coughs> get a better understanding of the complexities of wash planning, potentially also getting an understanding of the agenda of other sectors. I feel like there's oftentimes a big gap that uh, players, because they are in a certain sector or field, they 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 they, they sort of turn blind to um, the needs of other, let's say, ministries, authorities, communities, whatsoever. Um, we definitely hope to spark generally an interest in also not only WASH in general, but also into thinking about more holistically and more um yeah in the long-term sustainability of programs so that also a private company is not only thinking about where to put the next uh borehole hand pump or whatsoever but actually also considering what is the most uh sustainable solution in in the long run but it's definitely a process and uh, not replacing expert knowledge and, and work experience but i hope that it can definitely no i'm convinced that it can definitely foster exchange uh, build some knowledge, um, probably even teach about new technologies. We also had a session with WASH experts and we had some technologies in the game where they were like, oh, I've never heard about this. Can you explain this? And the manual will also feature abstracts on this. So even as a seasoned WASH professional, I'm sure that uh, everybody can learn a little bit on this. Thank you. I thought that was the last question. I was wrong. I'll be asked quickly now here, how do you promote your game? So far, mainly through our right now quite quite vast and big networks, we uh, put public posts through Susana, uh, also through certain LinkedIn groups, uh, asking people to sign up in the game uh, for the test playing. I'm not sure if it's allowed for if we are allowed to do it commercial and if we are allowed to share the test playing link if people are interested. Um, here, you can still sign up. If if uh, Gorel gives me a nod, then I will just share the link here. Um, and otherwise, uh, yeah, we've been in touch with CWE, with um, other institutes um, to, to get out the word. We have a, a pitch deck, we are trying to raise funds. So there are different channels and mainly uh, through our networks and uh, word of mouth. And through that, I think we've already reached a few hundred people and uh, also want to showcase, um, showcase uh, the game at the World Water Week to present the idea and get more interest and um, yeah, hope to hope to get interest. We're also trying to start crowdfunding with the game by uh, collecting pre-orders from individuals and organizations. Um, now, this I think was a quite elaborate answer to that short question. <laughs> right, right, right. Thank you, thank you very much, Nebi. Thank you very much, Dennis, for joining us on on the World War Three Communications Initiative.